Hello, everyone. Welcome to another recorded book discussion between the NRA's Book Club and Ann Arbor District Library. Tonight, we are discussing the book When the Tiger Came Down the Mountain uh, by Ni Vo. And it's, I guess it's a novella. Um, that's what I would say. But um, before we get started, we'll just go around and introduce ourselves and give a brief physical description if you're comfortable doing that. So I'll start. I'm Lucy. I'm a library tech at the Ann Arbor District Library. I do youth programs and adult programs, and I really uh, enjoy these book discussions. And I just found out this is our 32nd, so we've been doing it for a long time. Oh, and I am a middle-aged white woman with glasses and shoulder-length brown hair. I'm wearing a tan sweater, and I'm sitting in front of a wall with some colorful posters and watercolors in the back. And my name is Jacob. I am a member of the outreach team at Ann Arbor District Library. I can't believe we're at 30, 32. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful, that's a wonderful thing to hear. Um, I am a 30-year-old white male with facial hair, uh, blonde hair. Oh, geez. I'm sitting in front of a white wall. I'm Emily. I am a librarian at the Ann Arbor District Library. I work uh, collection-wise with kids fiction, but I do events mostly for adults. I am a white woman in my mid-30s. I have long, wavy, reddish-brown hair. I'm wearing a dark gray shirt and sitting in front of a mostly white wall uh, with a little sliver you can see of uh, Matisse's goldfish. Hi, I'm Anne. I am a book processor at uh, the Westgate branch currently, and I am a middle-aged white woman, heavy set with glasses, and uh, I've got long brown hair. I'm sitting in front of white pantry doors. Hi, folks. I'm Fatima. I'm one of the facilitators for the Unerased Book Club. I am a South Asian woman in her 30s. I'm wearing a navy blue and gold pattern shirt, and I Behind me is a digital background of the Chittagong skyline um, with some birds and flowers. Hey everyone, I'm Sheila. Um, I am the founder of Honoris Book Club and co-facilitator alongside Fatima. I'm a South Asian American woman in my early 30s with shoulder length, black hair, glasses, and I'm wearing unfortunately, a beige sweater against a beige wall. So hopefully I don't melt into it. Um, and When the Tiger Came Down the Mountain is a novella like Lucy introduced, but it's a, uh, the second in a series of five. Luckily, this um, can stand alone. And it is a, um, just to give a brief synopsis, it's set in a fantasy world inspired by Chinese history. And it follows a, um, a cleric from a government order focusing on recording history. And in this story, they are um, stuck, for lack of a better word, talking to a group of shape-shifting tigers. And this book follows a folktale and the retelling of history. So I'm going to open it up how we normally do and just ask, how did people find this novel or novella? Um, I'll just jump in and say that I loved it so much. I Again, it was like an unexpected one for me. And I did read the first one, I, I uh, The Empress of Salt and Fortune, because I'm just the type of person who's like, I have to go in order. Um, and I'm glad I did, because it just like pulled me into Chi, the cleric's world. Um, I think I would have been fine just reading this, but I know that I just got the third one from the library and I'm excited to read the fourth and fifth. It's like, um, I just think the structure of having this cleric who's traveling around gathering and recording stories is a brilliant way to to tell stories and um at least the first two were were so different and um one of the things I loved about this was just sort of the different perspectives like the you know the cleric's perspective and then the tiger's correction of it and I found that it there was like a, a lot of humor in that I thought actually because um at the tigers especially were pretty funny so I really really enjoyed this. 
I really loved it too. Um, I was surprised by the length. I got it on audiobook, and so I didn't see the size of the book. And I guess I just was not paying attention, um, noticing the ticking clock. So I ended up listening to it all over the course of one afternoon. And it was just like a delightful little snack of a book. But when it ended, I was ready for another chapter, another story. So it's nice knowing that, in theory, the other novellas are. Uh, for folks who do audiobooks, I thought it was really well narrated. Uh, I especially think it played up on a lot of the humor of the the tigers. I don't know that just like the warmth to their voice combined with the humor in the the telling um, just really made it so that I did I felt less of the peril and more was just invested in the storytelling, which I think fits the tone of the book. I, it was an incredibly enjoyable reading experience. Um, I can't say the the last novella I read. I, I can't recall. So I loved how small it was, but it was also huge. Um, it covered so much ground and so much of a world was built in this small little morsel of a book. But I also, I, I think because the um, story deals with myth and fable, um, when I was reading it, I thought to myself, you know, what is maybe the moral or what's the what's the what's the thing I'm supposed to take from these stories? And I'm really excited to discuss that with you because I'm I'm not exactly sure myself, but I, I got some ideas. I really enjoyed it as well. Um, I think that my favorite thing about it was just the exploration of the different versions of stories that get passed down depending on who the teller is um, and how you really can't trust either narrator. And it's not necessarily because of any uh, ill will, although maybe on the tigers, there's a little bit of um, nefariousness there, but just the stories that you hear and tell, assuming that they're the way it happened, when it's always just a version. Yeah, I also um, listened to the audiobook and I had so many of the same like reactions as you all did. First, I also started from the beginning because it's hard for me not to. So I I listened and I actually listened to four out of the five books, um, mostly because I didn't realize there's a fifth one. So yay, me. <laughs> um, but they're each like only a couple of hours on audiobook, so super quick. And the narrator is Cindy K, who is this Chinese Thai American narrator. Um, and she's phenomenal. Like I listening to her, I wanted to hear her narrate lots of other things. Like I think she had such great range and the pronunciation and just really excellent flow. I I very, very much appreciated all of that. Um, and then I have other thoughts about what it what these types of stories mean and what it means to be someone who records oral history in this way and just goes from town to town, but I'll save that for a little bit later. Yeah. Um, so this novella for me was actually kind of difficult getting into. Um, I'm so used to like longer form books where you have more runway to world build and to get to know the characters of the dynamics. And this is a really short runway. And I, and I was listening while doing chores. I was like, I'm sorry, wait, what happened? <laughs> like, who, who are these tigers? Why, who is this woman? Who are they referring to a woman with they pronouns? I was very confused for a little bit, like the flexibility and how they were describing versus talking to different characters. Um, but once I like wrap my mind around how quick it was going, um, which also required me to not do chores for like five minutes and just focus. Um, I really enjoyed, like everyone else has said, the world building and the um, the conciseness with which the writer write, uh, gets that onto the page. I also listened to it on audiobook. Um, and you're right, Fatima, like the narrator does such a good job of pacing and bringing you in without uh, making you feel like you're dilly-dallying. Um, so the book, like it took me a little bit of time, but I really came around to enjoying the flashbacks via storytelling it felt like we were going into some flashback somewhere went back in time to where the story originated 
and coming back to the present and the tigers are like, no, that didn't happen. Or yeah, that doesn't make sense. Like, why would, like, let's consider the practicalities of the story and why would a tiger do X, Y, and Z with a human? Um, and then uh, just sitting with the very obvious, like, implications of what it means to storytell, what it means to pass down history. It was a very, I loved it, like, just very blatantly, whose version of history do you continue to share? Um, and what does it mean when you find a person or an animal or an entity representing another component of the story and they're they're incorporating their pushback. It made me think a lot about memory, um, that it's not even just getting the story from two different perspectives, but it's the story's been told and told and you remember details differently. Um, because it didn't, you know, it didn't feel like either of the sides we were seeing uh, like you kind of uh, said, Anne, it's not like they were trying to be malicious or to tell a different version to get a different end. They're simply saying, well, no, 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 this is the way it was. And how you get that in not just in storytelling is in entertainment and books, but also in people sharing their stories um, or even it yourself. Are we are we reliable narrators? Probably not. Uh, and the fact that this little sweet story left me thinking a lot about the implications of recording a story, um, cementing that as this is the truth. And so that she was taking down multiple versions of that story. What do the people who read it down the line think? Yeah, I thought that that I mean, there's a, a real relevance to that too, like the idea of who, um, you know, who controls the narrative based on on whose viewpoint it is, and it was like that was in the back of my mind while I was reading both of these books. You know, it's just like you learn what you're what you're told and you take it as the truth. What I really enjoyed about these is that she, the cleric, incorporates the new truth that they're learning as opposed to. <laughs> what we see a lot of today, which is like, no, I, I know that I know I'm right. Um, and so it was refreshing to see the two histories sort of come together. I mean, especially from the cleric's point of view, that they were so concerned with getting the details, recording the details, you know, for all of time correctly, that they were willing to hear what, like in this book, what the tigers were saying and change their story accordingly. Did anyone else feel suspicious about whether or not these changes would be received well by, by the monks? Because, I mean, Chi in a lot of ways seems extremely pure in their intentions in documenting things. And so I one of the things that I found myself thinking about throughout the story is, do you know, how was Chi trained specifically to be this like neutral observer or as close to neutral as you can get and willing to hold nuances? And two, can that continue, especially given that clerics are given a certain positions of authority? And I'm assuming that whoever is above in the hierarchy of the clerics will be given greater authority. So I, I was just thinking about how power tend to, tends to corrupt and the visions around it. And I, I don't know if I got a clear answer in this case or if I'm supposed to have an answer, but I was really wondering like, if Chi takes it back, would it be received well? And was the full intention to amend the stories put it side by side so that people could know both versions of the story you know what I guess what is the intention when you go back with it and I think that probably would weigh into how well it's received yeah yeah, and yeah. oh go ahead I was just gonna say, this is one of the things I like about novellas as a form, uh, because you find yourself wondering about all the different directions of the story before and afterwards. And I find that I often think more about novellas than I do about reading a more fully formed novel. Uh, 
because of that. And, you know, sometimes it's fun. Sometimes I wish I just had answers. Yeah. And I think that for me, this, this question of like, do you put it side by side? Do you present both sides? All of that, like that really has been resonating a lot, especially with the current conflict between Israel and Gaza or and the war and thinking about how our media has been reporting on it and what, you know, there's a, everything from the language used to whose perspective is included, whose is not, you know, which stories get told, which are not told. Um, and is it necessarily like in the, in the case of this novella, you know, they didn't have the tiger's perspective until just then. But in our case, we probably have access to perspectives that are not being written about. So it's just, I it made me think very deeply about our current situation and present. I will say that one thing that I encountered while reading it, and part of it is just how well those folk tales were written, is... I kept wondering if they were based on something and I kept looking for what they might be based on and I couldn't find anything. They're just so grounded and they feel so rooted in uh, a country's or a, a region's mythos that, I don't know, I like that. Yeah, there was one where I felt, I, I mean, and I don't think it was, but there was like I was thinking of Persephone and the underworld in one because there were like those seeds but yeah like you and I was like well is this you know and then I was thinking I think it maybe is pulling from so many different stories and fables I also like that there's sort of a life saving component to this it's sort of like Scheherazade right like they're I mean they're the the cleric's trying to get the story right but it's also like as long as you keep telling these stories you're not going to come in and eat me um which just gave it sort of a fun and different edge. It's cool too, just to think that stories are that valuable. Yeah, I think the thing that will be what I think about this book in another eight years or however long is the the repeating and memorizing the the line of poetry and that the the role that that played in love and courtship and connection and the power that words have, that will be the thing I remember from this book. And in the same way that do you do, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, um, told that poetry to the tiger to save their life was the same thing that that she was doing to the tigers i was like ah oh, connections connections um but i ultimately didn't know what to make of of the tiger and um dew's romance um even calling it of like a romance in a traditional sense is difficult because there there is an uneven power structure there so it's like, is there falling in love? Can you fall in love with somebody who's going to eat you at any moment? You know, what, what, uh, is this a good relationship? What is a good relationship? Like, I had a lot of questions about the interpersonal relationship between those two characters. And then how the, um, the tigers and she, uh, kind of responded to those things. Um, and I still don't know what to make of it, really. I, um, I don't know. <laughs> I think those are such important questions, Jacob, especially about, you know, uh, is it just self-preservation on her part to live, live with the tiger? Or is that, is there real feelings of, involved in or is it like just Stockholm syndrome? Like what what actually is happening? So I would agree with that. Um, I like to, I don't know, in, in my head, I was like, okay, yeah, I could see that, that this would be an unlikely match, but that it continues to be. 
only for the sole basis that when the tiger makes a promise, she keeps it. And that being the foundation of trust seems like it's enough to build off of that the threat is not so immediate. Yeah. I was very much interested by, um, so she is telling the story and it's like, um, you know, the tiger says, I want you to be the, the, the person who feeds me and you get to eat the first plate off my food. You know what I'm trying to say? And the, the, the cleric was like, literal that's literal and the tigers were like no 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 no. that's a marriage proposal so then thinking about how do you i wonder if do you knew that or i just couldn't shake that it was predatory <laughs> and i was like oh this is romantic there's this rich language there's there's all this stuff about sex but there's also nothing about sex which is incredible um all this stuff about eating and in and, and music and poetry these sumptuous things. But I think I'm comfortable saying that it, it was a predatory relationship. So I'm like, now what the heck? <laughs> Is it a commentary on uh, the quality of romances that we get in a lot of our fairy and folk tales? Because there's a lot of not great stuff going on in those too. <laughs> Yeah, and there's definitely like power imbalances in, in fairy and folk tales. I mean, in the many, many of them. So maybe I'm looking at it in this like hyper modern lens where it's, but I like, yeah, and folk tales and stuff and old timey stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. So I wonder if, if that's just kind of looking at it as if it was two people in 2023, if that's even meaningful. But why make that choice in a new fairy tale that you're writing in a high fantasy world? Like that, the, what is the intention behind that choice? That's an excellent question. And one I haven't seen anyone ask the author necessarily in the reviews and interviews that I read. I don't, yeah. And I'm on the Goodread reviews and it goes, slow burn lesbian romance. I must have missed that. Because that wasn't in the book for me. But we, we've been down the road with Goodreads reviews many times. So <laughs> grains of salt. Well, I think too, when you're, you, you also bring things to the books you read. And so especially when you're dealing in fairy tale and folk where things, story represents much more than just the words you get on the page. If you're coming to it with a particular expectation or hope it can come out that way I mean thinking about romance think you know the books that I read when I was in high school the things that I thought were so romantic that going back and looking at it as an adult and saying oh man girl get some agency this is this is not good behavior and it's all about you you bring different things to it so you know whoever whoever read it probably really wanted that slow burn lesbian romance I did appreciate um, the casual nature with which they introduced or in which she introduced they, them pronouns for she. Um, I was just kind of comparing that casualness with the, um, now I can't remember the name of the book, the San Francisco you know, starting with Kat having this kind of traumatic coming out as a transgender to go from like, that stars. version of the story to we're not even addressing this. It's just a fact. A light from uncommon stars. Yeah, that's true. This, this book definitely... Um, just the subverts gender norms and kind of plays around with a lot of different things, um, including, you know, relationships between whom, like 
the this book is categorized as lesbian literature which to me when I read that I was like oh, oh okay I did not think about that it that way so yeah yeah if anything I would have said interspecies romance but I suppose that would sell fewer copies or maybe it would sell more I don't know <laughs> yeah you're right <laughs> My expectations I've seen would have a lot been of these different. books. And I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> My expectations would have been very different. <laughs> yeah. What did you guys make of the interspecies nature of the story, of all of the stories within the novella? It just made me think of folk and fairy tales, you know, like jump to little red riding hood the wolf is talking to the to the woman and they're they don't have the issues communicating maybe they're bringing in their different natures to it but people and animals are oftentimes they don't have the same barriers that we do in in the world we live in the world of folk and fairy tale so that felt very natural to me i had to keep reminding myself that oh yeah these are tigers that are talking now yeah, I think especially because the tigers, I mean, they, sometimes they were human, in human form, and sometimes they were tigers. Um, so yeah, just kind of like, it seemed to fit, to me, it seemed like a natural part of the story. There's also something inherently queer, and I cannot flush this out. I don't, I don't, I barely understand what I'm saying myself, but there's something inherently queer about like werewolves, shapeshifters, like you're one thing at one point and then you're something else. These these mythological tropes um, just seem gay to me. And I, I, I'm I not able to, to flesh that out, um, but it's something I'll be interested in, in researching because I, I really do in my heart of hearts feel that way. I just can't explain it. I think there's something to having multiple versions of yourself um, that is not necessarily queer, but especially in the world, you often have to pre present different versions of yourself. Uh, so from what you say, Jacob, that might, made perfect sense to me, uh, but I don't want to say here, take my ideas as yours. Well, I also think that it has something to do with living outside the binary, right? Human or not human, you know, you know, male or female, um, you know, the one particular species or another. So it's just like there's there's a lot of blurring of these binaries and living in a very gray zone, um, which I I think of when I think of queerness. That's that's one of the areas that I. I lean towards is that you you're upsetting that binary. Yeah. Cool. I'm curious for those of you who have read more than this one, uh, do they all have that story within a story structure? What characters carry over? I know, I assume she. Mm -hmm. She does. The bird does. Yeah, the, the bird's not in the second one, the, this one, but yeah. uh, which is too bad because its name is almost brilliant, which I love. <laughs> its name got mentioned a few times. Oh, yeah, its name did get mentioned. Really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know that anyone else does. It's just the cleric and the bird that helps you know, store it in memory. Yeah. Yeah, the, the bird was one of those things that when I heard it and then didn't hear about it again for a little bit, I'm like, okay, that's a first book thing that I didn't get. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, the, the book also very much gave me Avatar, The Last Airbender animated series vibes. And, and I actually, after I finished the four books, audiobooks, I was like, I have to rewatch Avatar now. <laughs> and I went and rewatched all three seasons of Avatar. So if you like that, then I think you would really enjoy these books. Um, they're on a different level in the sense of just like 
maturity adulthood sort of thing. but but other than that they there's that similarity in relationship between humans and animals between nature and um and the, like the spiritual world and as well as our world um yeah Was the Mammoth Core part of the first book or any of the subsequent books at all? No. Yeah. I found the lore about mammoths and um, mammoth culture. I really wanted to know more about that. I could have a whole little novella about the mammoths. <laughs> yeah, me too. This is probably a silly question, but what makes a novella a novella besides length? I don't know. I, I think I've seen I've seen books classified as both. Like I'm thinking of like the book Passing by Nella Larson. Some people call that a novel. Some people call it a novella. Um, or sometimes a novella is first included in a or part of a um short story collection but it's like a much longer story but i don't know if it, that that is like an author decision or a publishing decision or a reader classification i'm not sure i mean there, there could be an answer and i just don't know it but those are that's what i have observed yeah i think it's mostly length um but then especially if you look at some self-published things some things that people put forth and say our novellas really end up being unfinished novels. Uh, so I think for a novella to be good, uh, it there has to be some sense of, well, full story, I don't mean every detail given or something like that, but that sense of completion. And I imagine that a, a good novella is probably harder to write than a novel because, I mean, think about the world building like we talked about, that there could be a whole other bit of a book talking about this lore and I feel like odds are good the author knows that lore and just has been selective about what is being shared on the page yeah it's like when you go to a fancy restaurant and they bring out just like a dish that's like a small bite but it's very intricate and has all these colors and it's plated in this very beautiful way and you have this one little bite and you think oh that was salty that was crunchy that was sweet you, you think about it more than like, let's say like you're eating a big bowl of pasta. You're just, each bite is similar and you don't, you're not considering mm. it in that same way as if it was like a small little just bite. It felt more meaningful, uh, or maybe that's not the right phrasing, but there's something there. I love that analogy. That's excellent. There's like a whole world in there in that one bite. Yeah. I did learn um, that, I mean, a lot of it is just word count dependent, right? So there's something called a novelette, which is under 18,000 words. A novella is, comes in second, which is between 18 to 40,000 words. Then you have a short novel, which is between 40 to 80,000 words. And anything above 80,000 gets classified as... <laughs> um, as a novel which is amazing and just for our viewers who can't see the chat as Sheila said it's the it's the amuse bush of literature I love that I don't know I feel like these definitions are very plain fast and loose like just yeah. basing it off of word count first of all you're going to get some Charles Dickens of novella writers trying to bump it up to a no novel status but second to Lucy's point, like passing is a very like comprehensive novel with extensive plot. It's just short. And does that count? And like they made a whole movie out of it. That is pretty true to the plot. So if you can pull out 90 minutes of visual screen time, like does that also like negate the idea of a novella? No. Like I felt like passing, even though it's short, um, felt like it really felt like a novel yeah yeah I think what like 
something like passing, I feel like um, somehow more is being told to you or something like this or a novella. It's it's like a short story in that you aren't getting as, you know, Emily was saying, you're not getting every detail of um, the story, but the whole world is built. And so, and I think that's like also what makes a really excellent short story is when you understand things because of what's left out in addition to what is included. Um, but, but I do feel like I've seen things that, that have been listed as both and maybe it's just confusion. I mean, I mean, ultimately it's all made up and kind of arbitrary. So Are there other novellas that folks are like just held on to quite a bit? Well, I've read, see, I don't know if they're novellas, but um, Claire Keegan is an author who um, has written, I've read two of her books, one's called Foster and one, I can't remember the other name, of, but like, I loved them. I think I've read Foster like three times and they're very short. They feel like this short to me but I guess maybe they're not a novella because I've you know I don't know but um they feel about the same in length to this so that's what comes to mind for me but now I'm telling you this and I don't know if it's a novella so same I recently uh read The Swimmers which I really loved um but maybe that counts as a short novel it's about 200 pages uh, but it had that same feel like a novella, like I have decided a novella is defined in that it did. There was there was so much more that was unsaid, but it didn't feel incomplete. Um, but yeah, I, I that's another book I keep thinking about. Is that um, Julie Osaka? Mm -hmm. So I haven't read that, but I was going to bring up When the Emperor Was Divine, which is another of her books. It might have been her first novella that's set during um, the Japanese internment camps, um, which was excellent. So I would say that she does qualify as a novella writer. I've, I've read quite a few Japanese like novellas, which I, I feel like Japanese authors seem to have really mastered it. I'm remembering like Kitchen by Banana Yoshimoto, who... That, that book was just for me such a game changer when I first read it in high school and it was one of it was a lot about grief and grieving and um and I was just fascinated that she could pack that much into such a tiny tiny book um and then the other book that I read a few years ago that I still think about all the time is um uh, the emissary by Yoko Tawada I think um and it was about it also set in written by a Japanese author and set in like this post apocalyptic kind of world where the young people are born with disabilities and the elderly are the ones who are kind of taking care of the young people um, and, and it's this really interesting role reversal, but I, I just remember they were like very short, less than 150 pages and just, just so much world in such a tiny, tiny book. Yeah. Um, Of Mice and Men is considered a novella. I can see that. I read it in high school. I haven't read it since. So in my memory, it feels like um, this really intense book probably wasn't. Um, but again, when you're like 14 and reading it for the first time, yes, it's small, but it also packs a lot in there. Um, but I'm realizing I don't read a lot of novellas. I read a lot of vignettes or like collections of vignettes, but I don't read that in between. Mm -hmm. I was thinking like, oh, A House on Mango Street. I'm like, nope, not a novella. I was like, oh, maybe Within the Attic. No, nope, not a novella. <laughs> One that's purely sweet that I just looked up that I remembered uh, is The Uncommon Reader um, by Alan Bennett. It's, yeah, true novella, 120 pages. 
uh, about the Queen of England uh, discovering a love of reading. It's it I doesn't love, have a ton love, of depth. To I it, love that book. Just, I love that book. <laughs> it's it's such a sweet one, and I I reread it. I don't know about a year ago, and it mm -hmm. I, I loved it as a younger adult, and I still love it now with more life experience. A book that stands the test of time. That's amazing. I recently checked out from the library, and I haven't read it yet, A Psalm for the Wild Built. I don't know if that's a book anyone... It's right here, actually. Um, <laughs> and it, it looks like a novella. <laughs> I just wondered if anyone had read it and had some more insight. Yeah, I spend so much time reading just massive series, um, you know, seven, 10 book series with six to a thousand, 600 to a thousand pages in each book. And these, um, reading this reminded me how much I enjoy the small bites as well. Uh not at all about novellas, but something I was thinking about while listening to the book is the author is Vietnamese, but the story feels very Chinese, um, especially the idea of having like a bureaucracy or like a, a system to get people into the bureaucracy and you have to be oh, very qualified. And um, I don't have a fully flushed out thought, but it struck me as very pointed to have like the colonizing culture as the setting for this like a uh, historian or archivist come in coming in um that's that's as fully flushed as I've gotten or as flushed as I've gotten that thought I thought the story felt inherently Chinese and I also uh, thought the names were Vietnamese so I didn't there there's something there too like the the names of the characters, of course, is what I'm trying to say. Will you all, uh, as you often do, have the chance to speak with the author? Not this time. It, it makes me i I would have liked to find more interviews online from her about these books. I was able doing some googling, finding some things, but I. I want to hear her talk more about this world. <laughs> and yeah. maybe is she still writing them? Do you have a sense or is, is it five and done? Because maybe they're with releases of other ones, there'll be opportunities for, well, for more. This one just came out, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So hopefully, has anyone read any of, of her other books? Like, um, the Chosen and the Beautiful is one that I'd been interested in because I think it's a it's a, like a retelling of Great Gatsby with queer characters and um, yeah, but not a novella. No. I haven't read um, her any of her other works, so I can't speak to it. Um, we did reach out to her, um, and then. Some folks we hear from others we don't, and that's fine. So this is one of those. What did you guys make of Dew's like academic pursuits? Like her journey was going to this place to take this big test that led her whole like her whole life led up to it. And then when she was there, they were like, Are you down? And she was like, No. And I, I didn't know, I feel like there was a lesson or moral in there somewhere. Or maybe her journey on the way taught her that this thing was, wasn't was meaningful to her at all. Or I was fascinated by that world. I wanted the mammoth book and I wanted the world of that test and that whole culture as well. Yeah, having to... Um commit to what your life is or your at least your working life is from birth seems I mean I guess historically that's how it worked you did what your parents did but um so many of us change so much as we 
go through life, especially through childhood and adolescence and early adulthood. Um, I guess I'm a little hypocritical because I wanted to be a librarian forever, but uh, there are a lot of other things that I would have said I would have wanted at that age that I would be unhappy if that were part of my life now. Um, so I think there is something to maybe do realizing more who she is through that journey and recognizing that that wasn't her path mm -hmm. and that it's okay to not to say no to that path even once you've already done the work and gotten there yeah yeah because like how how can you ever know what the the path is going to be like there's no way she could have said well I think I'll probably meet this tiger and then we'll you know <laughs> be involved in a a romance I don't know you know it's just um like you can have the end goal in sight but there's no way to predict what what the steps are along the way oh yeah it, I continue to be very grateful for the traje the trajectories offered to us here in America in that sense like the liberal arts education side of things because um, in Bangladesh, for example, from a very early age, you pick whether you're in the arts or the sciences, and that's the direction you go in. And if you choose the arts, you're definitely closing the door on the sciences. Um, maybe not necessarily vice versa, but definitely in that direction. So I'm glad that <laughs> that's not the, that's not the case here. Um, and that is like one of the beauties of our education system. I'm going to push back a little bit and that it is starting to become that way where if you want to switch careers or like get into another field, you have to go and get another degree, which is completely unnecessary. Um, I'll speak for myself. Like I don't need an MBA to do what I'm doing or to do any of the work I've done post grad school, but it is basically required to move into something slightly different than what you were doing before. And to have such an expensive gatekeeping mechanism, whether it's business school or any grad school or any undergrad degree, um, is act. It's just like the American version of saying you can't do something. Um, but I also see the like an Asian American writer writing about like being groomed essentially or brought brought up to do one career and one career only um, as a critique of what that system looks like. Um, I mean, Fatima and I were both very lucky that we weren't told you have to do it one type of career, one out of three careers. Um, and that leads to like a healthier relationship to family, but also to like yourself. And it's, yes, like the reason why uh, she like, or no, Dewey, sorry, um, like backs out of going through the, the examination like a weird reason but at least it's like a reflection like a opportunity to introspect and be like is this really what I want after 18 years of study it's cool that I have this knowledge but I don't want to do this anymore yeah and to be fair I was told that I needed to be a doctor and I was pre-med for two years and when I finally decided against it, my family told me, well, don't tell anyone you've changed your mind. So I had to hide the fact that I was no longer pre-med for two years. And so I got a job. It's such a, an incredible career or like work life <laughs> that you were, you had the agency all along. Apparently. So, so yeah, it wasn't until I got a job and my family could brag about the job that I was allowed to tell people I was no longer pre-med. Yeah. Um, we are reaching towards the top of the hour. It sounds like folks are kind of wrapping up. Are there any last thoughts or anything that you want to share that you were not able to? Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us for another year of discussions. And I'm so celebrating the fact that this is our 32nd book discussion with you all. Uh, really, really glad and so looking forward to returning next year with a whole new selection of books. 
Um, for folks who are listening, you're welcome to join us in our regular book club meetings as well. Uh, you can sign up via email um, the, on our website, unerasedbookclub.com, and, uh, and just go from there. We send out a monthly Zoom meeting link with the guiding questions, and uh, yeah, it's a pretty chill group, so we hope you'll attend. And thank you, Ann Arbor Library, for having us. Thank you for, for being here and for um, another great year book. So thank you. Hi, folks. Have a good night.